Well, thank you so much for, for the introduction and thank you all for coming. Um, it, this is a great privilege for me uh, in, in a number of different ways. One personal, that uh, I've come back to Sweden again after five, seven, eight years uh, to revisit and to see um, SLU in particular burgeoning, strengthening, which is terrific. In my country, agricultural education is going through a crisis and becoming less and less significant and our voices are becoming less and less heard. The voices that are getting louder are the 1950s voices about the way agriculture should be further developed. In other words, we are now going back to um, developing more of our extraordinarily arid and vulnerable land. We're talking about reversing rivers so that we can increase production in the north in order to feed Asia, which is absolute nonsense, given that uh, by the calculations of the National Farmers Federation, Australia produces enough food in any year to feed 60 million people. 22 million people of those live in Australia. That leaves 40 million, which is 20 million less than the number of people that were added to the world's population last year. So to put it into context, we can only just feed ourselves and a handful of other people. However, the government we now have is obsessed with saying we need to get back to being what we were once, a major agricultural nation. This is partly because we are about to fail in the thing that took over from agriculture, which was mining. And as I shall point out, mining and agriculture are in huge conflict in, in our country, and we're seeing things in agriculture now that bring to the very fore the issues that the future will really focus. So whether it's climate change, whether it's feeding uh, refugees, um, whatever it is, there are now new, there is a new violence about agriculture um, in, in Australia, which I think is, is a, a portent, it's, it's an indicator of what the future might look like in agriculture around the world. I've got a whole lot of slides here which I'm going to flash through because I don't have time really to explain uh, a lot of them, but they will, be, uh, on, they will be available for you to take time. And please feel free at any stage uh, after I've finished uh, and after this seminar is finished uh, to contact me if you will, because I'm nominally retired and I actually hate retirement. I did it once for a week and got very bored. And so I would be delighted to enter into any communication. Let me start uh, from an unusual place. I want to start, unusual in the context of the future, I want to start with the past. And I want to start with effectively saying, if only Australia in the 1950s had done what you're doing now, we would not be in the state that we are in. In other words, we did not have a future orientation in agriculture in the 1950s. My unit in uh, the late 1970s started one, but we started from what I'm about to show you from the past. And then over the years um, noted a number of very important uh, concepts. This is the most important. Our belief is that any development of systems out there in the material and social world depend on systemic intellectual and moral development, so-called worldviews, of those who need to be involved in them. In other words, if we really want to transform the way things are done, not just in agriculture or in rural development, but anything, then we actually need, if it's to be sustainable, to change the way people view the world. That means my fundamental push is not on research qua research, as yours is, and I applaud you for what it is you're doing, but mine, if you will, comes from the other end, to complement what you're doing. Because my belief has become that unless the community who are to be involved or affected by change are involved in talking about those changes, it remains nothing but science fiction. In other words, people are not particularly seduced by arguments that are presented by the media and particularly by science itself, but they are convinced, in my opinion, when circumstances are such that they are shocked existentially into having to do something. We're seeing that already in the South Pacific, for instance, and in the Maldives in the Indian Ocean, where ocean rises are actually happening. And people now saying, 
this is actually now very serious. Now, in our country, because of its weird geomorphology and its weird climatic patterns, people say they're used to these climatic events. They're used to severe droughts, fires, floods, and so on. And that's true. What they're not used to is the increasing frequency of them and violence of them. And I keep using this word violence, and I mean it. Because I believe that as we've become more pacific, uh, as Western nations, more genteel, if you were, if you will, and why we get so upset by violence elsewhere is that we've forgotten the power of violence, and yet it is all around us and it is increasing. So there's the statement. I now want to sort of illustrate how we we dealt with that. We in my unit, which started in in 1978, my personal history, like most of us involved in this field, goes way back further than that. And I should just point out that I have a PhD in parasitology in animal science. Um, so I will offend anybody who is an animal scientist still, arguing that we need to move on beyond that or at least contextualize it. And I will offend social scientists because I'm not one and therefore I will make all sorts of claims. And even though I've worked with philosophers now for a long time, philosophers in the audience uh, will also be deeply offended by the fact that I don't seem to know any profound philosophy. I make no excuses for all of that because if there is a notion of transdisciplinarity, then I am an example of it. A jack of all trades whose belief is that experience drives what it is that I do. I don't sit and conceptualize until after the event. I put myself into shocking situations and then I try to make sense out of them in order to do something. And that's an important notion of what I do. Here's the history that we went back to, starting in 1978, which is the, uh, uh, the end of, if I push that button, I shall get a light. I don't, I wonder why that is. Push that button, I get a light. So here is the time, this was uh, late 1970s, early 1980s, and instead of looking at the future, as I said, we went backwards to say, where have we come from for the last 30 years in Australian agriculture? What's been happening? Uh, because if we're going to design programs in research and extension and education in particular, then we want to avoid mistakes that we've made in the past, if we have, and we want to see where the trajectory of the past in the present is taking us into the future and whether that's satisfactory. The answer overwhelmingly was no, it is not. That is the trajectory. Our message then from the late 1970s, early 1980s, was that Australian agriculture is non-sustainable. But the question became, what do we actually want to sustain? Because we can't sustain everything, as I'll illustrate. Here's what's happening. This is a four-fold increase. This is th these are all trend lines, of course, rather than graphs. Uh, but here's a trend line that was happening. We increased in, in that period, from the 50s through to the 70s, cropping by a factor of four. And we did that by area. In other words, farmers moved into areas that had never been, for, never been farmed before. And as you're all aware, of course, unlike the vast majority of other areas in the world, there was no agriculture as we understand it in Australia until 200 years ago. We did not have grazing ruminants. We did not have grasses that could be cultivated. And the Aboriginals weren't particularly interested in that anyway. They fed themselves quite happily with the way they did things. So into Australia, a highly arid and very fragile environment, we introduced European ways of farming, not particularly successfully, I have to say. Successful enough, however, because this is the period of the burgeoning of pesticides, of chemical fertilizers, of heavy machinery, and so on, this is what was achieved. The level of production rocketed upwards. At this point here, uh, of government intervention slowed down the process because we couldn't sell what we were producing, wheat in particular. And so livestock uh, increased at that point because we were trying to get rid of the grain and so we fed it to pigs. We'd read something about Denmark and we thought that'd be a good idea, we'll actually have pigs. So we moved into intensive pigs and poultry production, which prior to that we had not done. We had not followed the American model most of our agriculture in terms of animals was extensive. And of that, well over 50% was one commodity, wool. 
we were the world's best producers or the world's producers of the best wool, super fine merino. So that leap there really is nothing to do with cattle or sheep. Their numbers remained more or less static, but increased enormously in relation to pigs and poultry. And I read a factor in the newspaper this morning on the web that in Australia at the moment we kill 50 million chicken a month. I don't understand that. <laughs> There's only 22 million people of us. So people are eating a whole lot of chooks, a whole lot of chicken. Um, and that actually has substituted for, for beef and lamb. So our diets have changed significantly and that's an important point and was one of the issues that you raised in your future scenarios. Productivity also increased. In other words, it just wasn't the volume that increased, but it was the efficiency with which that volume <coughs> was achieved. But that too, at that point, was beginning to slow down. The rate of productivity increase was beginning to slow. That has continued. The rate of productivity in growth in Australian agriculture has continued to slow. And that has serious implications because in doing this, we needed to import everything. We needed to import machinery, chemical pesticides, chemical fertilizers at that stage, uh, and so on. And that meant that our terms of trade were continually declining, and that continues. In other words, the, the rate at which the prices of things that we needed to buy was going up faster than the rate at which the, the returns to the farmers was increasing. So in essence, to stay in farming, farmers had to be able to be 4% better every year in terms of their productivity in order to face those terms of trade. And that continues to this day. Socially, what was happening was very significant too. First of all, farmers were shedding labor, and they could do that because they were now using big machines and they're using chemicals instead of people. And then in the end, farmers could no longer hold out, and that started to decline. From a number here, uh, in terms of farmers, of around 200,000, we're now down uh, to around 100,000 real farms. Uh, and laborers, are, that continued to decline as well. In order to, to cope with this and with that, we had to buy machinery, and so farm indebtedness went through the ceiling at a time in the mid-70s here, where we had political upheavals, and interest rates went to 20 plus percent. So farmers had borrowed an eight uh, to buy machinery, and now, in addition to the cost price in terms of the terms of trade, they were no, now facing huge levels of indebtedness. As we shall see in just a moment, that had huge social implications. No matter how hard they worked, no matter what they did, net farm income continued to decline, as it still does. There are very, very few farmers now in Australia who make a full-time living at farming. More and more, large agribusinesses are coming in, which had not happened in Australia. Uh, had happened in the United States, of course, and to a certain extent in some parts of Europe, but had not happened in Australia. Now it is. And surprise, surprise, a number of those are Chinese. With all of this happening, of course, that would be anticipated, that the level of soil erosion, of salinization, acidification, desertification, anything Asian you could think of in terms of degradation was occurring in Australian soils. Um, and finally, in terms of the role of the politi political economy, and extremely importantly, agriculture was no longer deemed to be all that important. Um, from 20%, it dropped down, oh, dropped down to about 11%, um, uh, I think, at about there. It's now 2% and less. So in terms of, of political notice, agriculture dropped off. Mining started to boom, tourism started uh, uh, as two big ones, and then more recently, education. The fourth largest export income in Australia at the moment is education. We sell education, particularly to people from the subcontinent and from China and the rest of Southeast Asia. There were huge impacts um, and sources of impacts. First of all, Inevitably, there was a decline in, in rural societies. And Australia, of course, as you know, is a vast continent. And as these large farms uh, from the eastern coast moving west um, became less and less viable, so local towns started to suffer and then in the end collapse. So schools would close, banking uh, would disappear, health services would go, shopping shops would go, 
general infrastructure would go uh, and uh, social capital in terms of clubs and associations would decline. So during this brief 30-year period, there was extraordinary turmoil, fervent violence in the countryside. Suicides. Australia hadn't known that before, or if it had, it didn't talk about it. Now young men were driving their motor cars into trees. That's the commonest form of suicide in the rural areas. Violence in the, in the family, um, alcoholism common, use of narcotics and incarcerations, particularly of Aboriginal people. And I want to talk briefly about them in just a moment. There was consumer resistance. Consumers were now beginning to say, the food that you're actually selling us is not particularly safe. It's, it's got chemicals in it. We don't like that. We want you to improve it. In terms of food security, therefore, we're, we're not as secure as we thought we were. Whilst we are an exporting nation, as I've suggested, most of that was wool. So are you really growing what it is that, that we, the consumer, wants or needs? We were importing a lot of stuff. And health issues associated with one extreme of malnutrition and, on the other hand, with obesity. And in terms of, again, Aboriginals, this was a major, major issue as it continues. In terms of citizen activism, farmers hadn't been used to this before. Now there were people saying and calling for rights to land for Aboriginals and others. And the interesting thing, of course, is that historically the land by Europeans was just taken. There was no law. People just squatted, as they did in the United States, and then claimed ownership. The fact that the, the Aboriginals had a different association with the land made it very easy to do, because no Aboriginal claimed ownership. The land owned them, if anything. Animal welfare, big movement. Peter Singer uh, is a well-known name. He was becoming active then in the, in the early 1970s, mid-1970s, talking about the fact that animals have rights, not just the welfare of animals, but that they have rights. So there was a whole new philosophical set of questions coming in that uh, people were not what used to. The environment in terms of activism, landscape, people were really concerned about conditions like, like dieback and so on. Water becoming a major, major issue, and then the whole issue of human welfare. Now, I say all that because one of the big issues about futures thinking has to do with the surprises, not trajectories, not things we can calculate, but things that emerge. The huge surprise in Australia was that all of a sudden, farmers who had been the heroes, who'd actually developed the nation from the late uh, uh, 18th century through to this period, were now all of a sudden the villains. And so there was an enormous psychological claw hanging over rural Australia to say, we are no longer uh, the, the people that we thought we were. Furthermore, as the population in the urban areas grew, so people lost their connection, their family connections with the land. Now, all of that is now increasing. And in terms of what uh, we would think about, of surprises in relation to futures, then these are the sorts of issues that rarely appear in the literature. Although people talk about surprises, they're often not factored in, and yet they are absolutely crucial. One of the things that I want to, to pursue now in some depth is the fact that we believe when we started that in the late 1970s, one of the major issues was that people did not understand the systemic nature of agriculture. In other words, they didn't understand farms as systems. The economists saw them as in terms of money exchange, in terms of export for the country, income, as it were. Uh, the uh, major crops and animal services saw it as commodities. But people didn't think about the fact that what farms were or could be considered to be systems that interacted with environments in both directions. There were three systems principles that we started with in the late 1970s guiding our work. Wholeness, that whenever we looked at something, we needed to think about the wholeness of it all. So the system itself is whole. It's made up of little holes that interact together to create the bigger whole. And the bigger whole, the system, is itself set within another system called an environment. Now, to us, it makes sense only to talk about all three. It doesn't make sense just to talk about farming systems, for instance, or it doesn't talk about ecosystems. Uh, one assumes the language, the construct of all three. So one needs to be quite sure about which level we're talking about, 
at any given moment, and then to be aware of the fact that that is uh, uh, involved in a set, so it, they are embedded with each other, and there are forces, there are dynamics within and between. Now that creates quite a complex, although seemingly simple picture. And yet our belief was, and this was actually, has then been over the next uh, 30 or so years, illustrated to us that most people either don't think that way or can't think that way. They are so imbued with the sort of education that we get in, in Australia that makes it quite linear that it's very hard, it's, we have discovered, for people to actually think in systems terms. So people may well concentrate on what they call a farming system, but they don't see it as set within an environment, as indeed your future studies have done beautifully. So you've made the very clear distinction between what's happening in the environment and this, and quite rightly, in my opinion, you've concentrated on this. This then has to do something about that, one way or another. And this, this is the set of uh, subsystems, if you will, is what does it. This can't do it by itself. There has to be a set of subsystems that themselves can be controlled. Now, this is the way that methodologically we now approach this. And this didn't happen in the early, in the early days. This really only started to emerge in the late 1980s, maybe a decade after we started, where we suddenly now accepted the fact that we really needed to understand the future uh, and not just work on why the past hadn't helped us all that much. And this is our construct, which we use to this day. Uh, the idea that it is useful to think about the environment from six different aspects, recognizing systemically that they all interconnect. And so rather than asking a group of sociologists to go away and work on that, or a group of technologists to work on that, we want everybody to work on everything so that they understand not just the domains, but the interactions between the domains. And here is the learning system. This is, was a major breakthrough for us in the early 1980s to argue that if you're going to deal with a system, then you have to recognize that you are innately part of that system. The system is only there because you've invented it. It doesn't actually exist. And so the relationship between this and those and those and those is crucial. Here's our little anagram uh, where the I is inquiry. It's how you inquire into all of this that makes it uh, so important. So here it is, I, the inquiring subsystem. These are slides that we use when we're w working with communities, so they may appear extremely crass and, and basic, but they are really important because of the words that are in there. As scientists, most of us are used to the idea that we observe. In our process, we don't observe, we experience. We throw ourselves into the actual situation so that the, the situation itself says stuff to us beyond just an objective observation. We then, whatever word you want to use here, theorize or think, or we try to make sense out of that experience in order to design something, to do something about it. Now, I know enough about European education to make the general claim that worldwide universities are not particularly good at running curricula based on these principles. What we do is we, we theorize and the student is told the theory, which they may well then check out that way, but they're not doing it from an experiential point of view. They're not experiencing it in the first place and then trying to make sense out of it by using theories from elsewhere. And this is an important distinction between our work and your work in terms of futures, but highly complementary. In other words, we're starting from the community end. We're saying, okay, it's lovely to have people who know what they're talking about in terms of the theories and their observations, but we actually want people to figure out what it is they're experiencing, the water, the sea level rises in the Pacific Islands, the Maldives or whatever. That's real, that's shocking. And that's experiential, existential. For me, the role of, of scenarios is to make them the process so powerful that people actually live the experience of the future. So it's not like reading science fiction. It's not like reading expert scenarios, both of which are incredibly important. But it's complementary. People themselves have to feel they've got to do something. So it's not just, I'm shocked by it all, therefore paralyzed. <laughs> 
I'm shocked and I've got to do something about it, whatever that is. Change my personal behavior, change the, the social groupings that I work with, in the end, try and change politics. I have to say in Australia, we are being immensely unsuccessful in doing that in relation to climate change alone, let alone anything else. I am aware that this is going onto the web and I probably won't be allowed back into Australia, but what the hell. One of the issues that we discovered early on when we started to do research and, and run curricula was that some people got it and other people didn't get it. Lots of people, uh, and they continue to this day, in the systems movement, for instance, are still linear. They're still causal. And again, I congratulate the, uh, the authors of your five scenarios in that that point is made very clearly. It's not linear and causal. If it were, it would be simple. It's not. It's complex and messy and surprising. Now, to, to accept that's the way the world is, is very difficult for people who A, like certainty, and who doesn't, B, who are educated in a way that's certain. And science, of course, is about certainty. Now, again, let me stress, I'm not anti-science. I'm a scientist. But my science, as I did in my PhD, taught me that i really got to come up with something that's reasonably certain that I can then state as a hypothesis in order to test it and is reasonably useful at the end and from a pragmatic point of view, if not the truth, then it could be used with some degree of, of confidence that it would be a useful understanding. So we became very obsessed with this idea that it is the world view that determines what people do. In other words, what we do in the world is simply a reflection of how we construe it in our minds. And we construe it in our minds with at least three dimensions, most of which most of us are totally unaware of. In other words, we hold a set of beliefs about nature, which we'll call ontologies. We hold a certain set of beliefs about the value of knowledge and knowing and the value of some knowledge over other forms of knowledge. And the nature of human nature, particularly where it involves human values and again in particular related to both ethics and aesthetics. Now, all of that lot is sort of happening on in, our, in our world, somewhere as an interface between our mind and the world we're experiencing. Let me very briefly go through this. Normally, I would spend much more time on this because it's significant. But here are two different ontologies, both legitimate, but you can't have both at the same time. At any given moment, you're making assumptions about the nature of the world that is either it is what I'm looking at is a whole, and if I try to break it down, then I lose its essence. Or I can study it in bits, and if I add all the bits together, we will have a whole. They are two profoundly different philosophical positions. Most of us through our education come through this world. Let me again stress, there's nothing wrong with this world at all. It's extraordinarily valuable. But it misses out on a whole lot of phenomena that are appearing here. This has been, of course, promoted by lots of philosophers over thousands of years and promoted by some scientists um, uh, going back to, and, and philosophers of recent times, relatively recent times, like, like Goethe, for instance. It is the basis of organic agriculture, organic approaches to agriculture, when people talk about <laughs> being more holistic. You can't be more holistic. You're either assuming a holistic position or a reductionist position at any given moment. In terms of knowledge, we can make a distinction between objectivism and contextualism. Objectivism, again, is the notion that we can test knowledge empirically, or we can test it logically and rationally by scientific logic. Or, in contrast to that, we can take contextual knowledge, which says, well, knowledge in particular context works. It may not be objective, from our point of view, anyway. And again, let me use the example of Aboriginals. Aboriginals, uh, basic epistemology, this is an epistemology if that's an ontology, is that the knowledge that they have is given them to them by their elders. And if it isn't, then they have no knowledge about it. So when the white settlers first arrived in Australia, there was nothing in the dream time, as it's called, that said at some stage or another a whole group of white people are going to arrive in ships. And so the Aboriginals just saw it as something beyond their comprehension, according to the people who've studied these things. Now, again, most of us who've worked uh, in, in uh, context elsewhere would recognize animism, for instance. Anywhere you go in Asia or in Africa, animism is alive and well, a way of understanding the world 
which is not objective and rational in the way we understand that, but it's equally useful. The Aboriginals were around for 40,000 40, 40, years. I mean, they must have got something right. The third one, which complicates matters enormously, is this set of values, the axiology. The distinction here is just one that I've plucked out of communitarianism, where one is really concerned about self within a community, uh, and the opposite one, libertarianism, which of course is the opposite, to say that you know, I am an individual, and uh, having lived in the United States for ten, eight years, um, I recognize that distinction very clearly. One could write neoliberalism there, in the way it's translated politically anyway, in terms of saying, well, uh, neoliberalism is really allowing the market to make choices that here the community makes. Now again, nothing wrong with any of those positions. They're just different. And if we're addressing particular types of issues like sustainability, we need to recognize that people are coming to the debate from quite different perspectives. And the conflicts that arise in arguments about sustainability, for instance, are almost invariably to do with differences in worldviews. To simplify that, uh, we in our work identified four particular worldviews, leaving out axiology, although it's there, arguing that if you looked at the development of Australian agriculture over 200 years, you could see a progression from egocentric, which is where the farmers themselves, using their own contextual knowledge and reducing it down to their own farm, as it were, were struggling to make an existence where this, the parameter of success was one's own well-being. Science and technology come along and make a huge difference. They enable uh, these aims and purposes to be greatly amplified. Now, many people, of course, my father being one of them, did not accept that shift. This is a shift from there to there, uh, but still based on the idea of focusing on the small part of everything. The systems movement um, and other disciplines like ecology and economics took an ecocentric view. It was now holistic, it was now recognizing that wholes, whether they're societies or economies, have properties that you can't determine by studying the parts in isolation, but it's still objective. It's still we need to be able to measure stuff, we need to be able to know stuff. Again, all important. The fourth one is to accept the, the, the notion that it is a contextual and a holistic viewpoint that we need to explore. It's not necessarily any better, but most of the time we haven't explored it. And if we haven't explored it, we don't know its advantages. Our curricula and our research projects that were dealing with community involvement, particularly in rural development, believe that that's the route we would like to take. We would like to help people move from a technocentric without abandoning it, but contextualize it by understanding its role within here and then from here to here. Now this, of course, exposes values, spiritualities, and all sorts of things that most people really would prefer not to talk about. Uh, I'm currently involved in the fifth year of a project in Mozambique where uh, the people I'm working with started there. They have an absolutely wonderful sense of themselves in nature, um, but are also aware of some of the impediments that this has brought them, um, where large corporations have, have come in and taken over land and of course they've had civil wars and all sorts of other things. Uh, just going back to that, that I will not dwell on but that's the eventual model that we deal with. In other words, our focus of systemics is not primarily with the system out there but the system in here. It's how do, learning together, do we make sense of a world which we don't all agree on in terms of what it is we're seeing we certainly disagree with in terms of the values and the ontologies and epistemologies we're applying to it, and our levels of competencies, therefore, and types of competencies differ extraordinarily. An important point here that we were very hesitant about in the early 80s but became more and more confident about the more and more we worked overseas particularly was this notion of in, intuitive, spiritual, um, revealed knowledge. Now, as a scientist, one might say, well, that's you know, not particularly uh, objective. True, it's not at all subjective from the way we measure it, but it is extraordinarily useful. And if you think about the major conflicts in the world at the moment, this is where they sit. It's people holding this particular set of beliefs that they would hold is better than another set of beliefs and worth dying for. So it's pretty powerful stuff. 
Very briefly then, I just want to flash through these. Now, this taking all of those ideas then, how would you turn that into a scenario process that enables people in communities to come sort of uh, to some sort of consensus about the sort of world, first of all, that they want, and this is different from your process. In other words, we start with the idea of let's talk about a preferred future first of all, let people have their say about the future they would really like to have, because that indicates differences right from the start. It also provides stopping off points, as it were, in terms of the, the backcasting, again, to which you refer, to say, well, if that's uh, what you want to get there, what has to happen to get there? When I first started out in management positions, this was the sort of notion of strategic planning, that here's where we are, here's where we'd like to be, so strategic planning is simply trying to move from there to there. And I can remember going to workshops about the future of the wool industry is a good example of saying, this is what we really want to do. We want everybody in the world to wear two pairs of socks made of Australian wool, and we're in business. And the reason why we're not doing that is whatever it was. So we had to move from there to there. And then we discovered uh, scenario planning in the late 1980s, early 1990s. And as you have discovered, found out that you can have all sorts of different futures. The difference between your work and our work is that what you've done is to take a group of very intelligent people in the sense of knowledge in that objective sense and come up with five scenarios, all of which make terrific sense to anybody who is aware of, of world conditions from a rational perspective. Our work in complement complementarity to that is to introduce people to a process that enables them to construct their own scenarios in an experiential way they, they live them, they believe them. Then, when they've done their scenarios, um, which aren't necessarily particularly rigorous, we then can introduce them to the literature like yours, and they will understand your literature far better than they would have just reading it cold. The methodology, very quickly, is based on the acronym of QUESTS. Uh, the Q is the start-out point of uh, why you're doing this in the first place. In your case, it was research. In our case, it might be people in communities who have to deal with rising sea levels or whatever. Uh, the key question, this is the I in the inspect, is how. Um, and we introduce them to the whole idea of experiential learning as a formal process which underlies everything. U is the utopic vision that I've just talked about. How do you actually help people to discover the future they really want? Uh, S then are the scenarios generated um, in a slightly different way to yours but using the same sorts of principles. Uh, T then becomes the, the issue of saying, well, okay, if that's what's going to happen, what do we, the people who are involved in the construction of these scenarios, need to do to transform whatever it is we need to transform? Ourselves, our communities, our businesses, uh, whatever. And then finally, those transformations are turned into strategies where transformations are, in essence, the planning part, the designing part of the experiential process and strategies of what it is you're actually going to do. Now, this uh, is run in all sorts of different ways. We run it quick and dirty, like now, uh, or we run it uh, over a series of, of um, workshops, half-day workshops, two-day workshops. The best ones that we do, and we've done two national ones now, one for the Australian Business Foundation and one for the teaching profession in Australia, both took two years, and they were punctuated by a series of workshops uh, all over the country. Um, but we, I now have done hundreds of these, these quick and dirties, as it were, hoping that people like you would then come up with some formal scenarios that people would then not only understand far better, but also then, in fact, be able to add to and embellish further. And that's just the process that we use. The impact analysis is something that we've uh, only relatively recently introduced um, because we've become very, very concerned about governance across market chains um, there are four families, for instance, who control the entire poultry industry in Australia, four families. There are ten companies that control 50% of the world's seeds. Uh, the issues now have suddenly become, in terms of scenarios of the future, what are the implications of that? What are the implications of changes in governance, which in the end leads to, to politics? And there's my five as future agriculturalists. Uh, are, are the future agricultures that we're training as researchers or educating as undergraduates, uh, in my opinion, if they are to be systemic, if they are to understand all the phases of the complexity, then they need to appreciate that we need to be able to understand all of those, not necessarily be particularly competent at them, but at least understand. Now, again, in my country, it is perfectly possible to go through an entire education through to a PhD without ever exploring nine-tenths of those. 
and in particular, and again I've become very obsessed about this recently, is the whole idea of ethical defensibility. Um, most of what's happening in Australia at the moment in any development area, whether it's industry, uh, whether it's to do with jobs, whether it's to do with mining, whether it's to do with decisions about land use, uh, are being done without any, without any reference to moral responsibility whatsoever. And I find that, um, well, an appalling indictment, I guess, of me and others as educators that we actually haven't got that point across. And that the debate about sustainability in the end is nothing more than a moral debate of what, what it is that we should do the question being why should we or should not we do something rather than what can we do uh, or could we do. And so let me leave you with that thought. That's the sort of complex story. I've rushed through it enormously, as I've said. Um, let me again congratulate the work that you're doing in, in Futures of Agriculture. I would like to, I would hope that we could be uh, collaborating in some way or another in terms of, of bringing the two together, as it were, with community involvement. And I've heard that you, in fact, uh, thinking about engaging in that. Um, for us then, it is the process of scenarioing, of thinking about the future in a very rigorous way through that quest process, uh, uh, rather than starting at the other end and saying, well, you know, here are five views of the world, what do you think about that? Thank you.